analysis of emergence and talk about cryptanalysis of non-lattice based schemes for the most part. Um, and I feel like this, I mean, there's a lot of post-quantum crypto fans in here, right? People who want to advocate for like lattice based crypto everywhere. And so I, there's like two approaches, right? You can wait for the physicist to like build a quantum computer or you can proactively take out the, the competition like classically. So lattices are a useful tool for this. So um, you'll have a few things in your toolbox maybe, hopefully. There's a lot of boring compu computations in this talk. So basically we're gonna do like a super way too fast survey of like a bunch of different techniques. Um, and a lot of these are like super ad hoc and I'm gonna be waving my hands like incredibly vigorously through the whole talk. So I apologize for the people who are rigorous. Um, and, but maybe, I mean, there's some good techniques in here that like don't always seem to get translated. So maybe there'll be something useful. Um, otherwise it's fun to break things. So we're gonna break things. Um, so our warm up number one will be knapsacks because this is the beginning of lattice based script analysis. Um, so uh, the sort of idea behind a knapsack and the hope behind sort of building knapsack cryptography um, was that knapsack should be an NP-hard problem. So we have a bunch of integers, A1 through AN, and some target integer, and you want to find a subset of those elements that sum up to your target integer. Um, so you, know, you could write this as like a, finding a solution to this linear inequality, like ZIs are 0, 1. You want to find a set of them that, that satisfies this. Um, okay, canonical NP-hard problem. Uh, so the attack outlined by Ligarius and Eligko, and there's like a bunch of different versions of this. The simplest version is the knapsack lattice basis. So um, these are row vectors, right? And so um, if you find some subset of these rows um, that zeroes out this last coordinate, then you get like a one in all of these locations and this should be kind of like a small vector, and um, in, th in fact, like you expect to be less than square root of n in in length. And so, if these AIs are not too large or um, not too small, and they're like d uh, chosen randomly according to um, some useful d distribution, then you can use some density argument to show that um, this desired vector is likely the shortest vector. And then you can hope that some lattice reduction algorithm will find it. Um, so there are a few things that you can do to soup this up because it doesn't work super well in practice when you actually try to run it. You can do things like put weights on the diagonal to try to um, sort of force these ZIs to be small rather than sort of arbitrary integers that the lattice reduction algorithm happens to like. Um, in the 1980s, we've heard this a couple of times when the, when the original papers were written, um, they sort of stopped what we hope that LLL will find the shortest vector because they were running it on super tiny instances where LLL did find the shortest vector. Um, in practice, of course, um, more advanced versions of this are kind of like the lattice-based crypto that we're using now, so um, obviously there's something here. Um, so, but this is sort of not true anymore, but obviously there are sort of a lot of, um, well, for, for small lattices, this, this does work. Right? And this is a very common shape of lattice, the basis that we see a lot, the knapsack basis. So um, we heard a lot about lattice algorithms in practice um, in the last talk. Um, so just for like super concrete terms, um, I'm mostly going to be talking about using LLL. So there's like kind of two things that we care about in practice. And I care about concrete computations. So Martin said he didn't care about concrete co computations and he wanted to just set parameters. I care about actually running concrete computations. So the, the things that we care about for concrete computations, one is empirically if you choose like a random lattice and you run LLL on it, you get a much better approximation factor than the provable guarantee. You get like a 1.02 to the dimension as your approximation factor. Um, and this works pretty well for, um, for kind of cryptographically generated lattices. Um, the other thing that's relevant is what size of lattice can you actually run LLL on beyond the fact that it's like polynomial time. So uh, kind of the best numbers that I've seen, this is a paper that was posted on preprint archive last month. Um, so dimension 4096 with 6,000 bit integers in four days. Um, as far as I know, they have not released their implementation. This is paralyzed, um, so it's a, it's a new technique. Um, but roughly kind of a few thousand dimensions-ish is like what is at the limit of, of what people are actually concretely able to compute. Um, yeah? 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 Ye
you can precisely define random if you want, or you can wave your hands and also like not precisely define it. Maybe if my hands are okay. Yeah. Does it apply to the cryptographic? Uh, does the analysis apply to cryptographic analysis? So empirically, I mean, this is this is a uh, this is not this is an empiric result. This is experimental. It's not um, proven. If somebody could prove this, it would be awesome. But as far as I can, as far as I know, I should have put that as an open question. Actually, is say something rigorous about this. Do you have anything rigorous? I don't remember the results, but there are partial results to, uh, towards proving this 1.02 to the dimension. There's some stuff about sand piles. Hmm? Yeah, there was a PhD study at Stanford. Um, I don't remember mm -hmm. But there is, okay. there is like, partial, sort. yeah. Um, empirically, what you can do is you can generate like a random lattice that looks like this and run um, LLL on it, and what you find is one point, like an approximation factor of 1.02. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, here are six thousand bit numbers. Uh, a bit numbers means like a subset sum with the modulus, which is six thousand bits, uh, or. Uh, I don't remember what kind of lattices they were generating, but um, uh, yeah, a knapsack lattice with with 6,000 bit integers should be relatively um, representative of, um, of a random lattice for these purposes. No, but in terms of dimension, oh, in terms of yeah, this would be the determinant. What if you take a square matrix where all the oh. entries are 6,000 bits, uh, then the determinant would be even bigger than that. Uh, oh, uh, I don't remember if it was determinant or whether it was something else. Somebody could look that up now and, and, and correct me. Um, so, yeah. We heard a lot about um, BKZ and enumeration in the last talk also. So I just grabbed like the uh, like largest result that I could find from latticechallenge.org. And um, they were doing 250-dimensional um, um, uh, BKZ and pruning. So that's somewhere um, where we're at in terms of like finding or like approaching exact shortest vectors. Um, and then of course, if you actually want to run this stuff, uh, the implementation to use is FPLLL, where many of the authors are in this room. Um, so I put some of the people that are in this room that I can see on the, they get every vote on the slide. So that's sort of the, the practical note. Um, okay, so back to our knapsack problem. Um, so we are asking for, kind of a short integer solution to like a linear equation here. Um, and I just want to note that finding an integer solution is trivial, right? Like if uh, one of these elements has like GCD1, then you can just like use the ex extended Euclidean algorithm to find some integers satisfying this, and then you can just like multiply by your target, and that gives you an integer solution. So that's trivial. And if you're not careful in setting up your um, lattice reduction problems, um, often LLL will be super helpful in like find solutions that look like this for you. Um, so it is like one of the dark arts of like doing all this cryptanalysis stuff is setting up the problem so that it does something, it does what you want and not the easy thing. This is totally not a precise statement. Um, okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about knapsacks. Um, our warm-up number two is going to be Entrue. Uh, so we already saw Entrue at least once um, in the past couple of days. So just like super quickly, okay, so we have our um, ring. We're working like an in integer, like polynomials with coefficients mod Q, mod X to the N plus one. And then we take two like small polynomials in the sense that the coefficients um, are in negative one, zero, or one, like kind of, I think, equally distributed between them. And so we take two random, randomly generated polynomials of that form in this ring, and then the public key is GF inverse, um, that value computed over this ring. And then the entry problem, among the other things that you might want to do, is given the public key, like how hard is it to compute the, the secret key, so the, um, the factors. And so the Coppersmith and Shamir attack um, looks like follows. So um, if you have this MH, I was gonna write this out, but it was like too big. So if you make this like circulant matrix, we've already seen this a couple of times, that represents multiplication by H, um, then this has the property that if you multiply like the vector that corresponds to the coefficients of F times this matrix mod Q, then that's equal to the G value. And so if you set up 
this kind of 2n by 2n um, matrix where you have the identity um, in one block and q times the identity in, in this block and then this multiplication by h matrix in this block, um, then this vector that is the solution that's like f and g is a vector in this lattice. So you see, you see if you like multiply on, um, I'm doing row vectors, so, so if you like take here, if you multiply like f, um, then that ends up multiplying by here, and so you get like the coefficients of f, and then here you can have some other garbage that's like reduction mod q, and that gives you the coefficients of g. So that's the insight behind the Coppersmith and Shamir attack against Entru. Um, so obviously the way around this is to make it so that this is really too large to solve, um, set up your parameters so that you don't find actually the, um, the shortest vector. Um, then there's a set of back and forth. There's a number of authors in this room who have written papers on like variants of this where you exploit parts of the algebraic structure of, of this lattice. So there are things that you can so um, the reason I show this is sort of, um, I think both the knapsacks and the entry um, problems sort of set up the main idea of what we're going to be doing here, which is that many cryptanalysis problems can be formulated either as you want to find some small solution to some polynomial or system of equations subject to some constraints, or you want to find a polynomial with small coefficients. And sometimes these are equivalent. like. Or, or you can actually formulate them as, as like dual problems, that if you find um, a polynomial with small coefficients, it has a small solution, or if you find a polynomial that has small, like a small solution, maybe it has small coefficients if you regard it in the right way. So this is like the sort of big picture of like the framework that we're gonna put a lot of these problems in. So we've seen this a number of times in a bunch of the lectures already. Um, so I just want to sort of mention, because this is gonna come up a lot in our concrete representations. So if we have some polynomial, um, then we can embed it in a lattice in sort of multi, or we can represent it as a lattice vector in a couple of different ways. Um, we can represent it as a sequence of coefficients, or we can represent it as like evaluating it at different uh, points. Um, and both of these um, are homomorphic under addition, so the lattice will preserve like the additive structure of like you can add two polynomials together and you get another polynomial. Um, but the lattices are going to be introducing a new geometric structure that doesn't exist in a lot of the cryptanalysis problems that, like a priori. So like we have these algebraic problems of like find some polynomial that you multiply it by like the inverse of another polynomial and you get the solution. Um, that has no geometric structure, but once you put it into a lattice, suddenly there is like a geometric structure and we try to exploit that somehow to find our solution. Um, but like one of the things that you end up fighting with is that the geometric guarantees like don't map exactly onto the solution that we want. And so we're trying to like use this, these lattice algorithms as like a black box to get what we want. It's kind of a, the main thing. So it's like weird to talk about like the L2 norm of a polynomial. So we have to like do some funky things to get around that. But somehow we don't know how to talk about like the right norms for polynomials. Um, okay, so um, I guess that's kind of like the intro. Now we're gonna move on to like at least my favorite theorem. Um, maybe not your favorite theorem. Um, so uh, I'll spend a while talking about Coppersmith's method. Um, so I'll start with the theorem statement. Um, so Coppersmith's method says that given some polynomial f of degree d um, and some integer modulus n, we want to find all of the integer roots um, that are small, they satisfy some bound, um, and that are zero mod n. Right. So um, this is, okay, this is fine, I don't know. It's some theorem. Um, why is this actually interesting? So for one, um, a general method to solve, like find solutions to, to polynomials mod n would actually just break RSA outright because the RSA problem um, is precisely um, if you have some cipher, like RSA encrypted ciphertext, you want to find um, a, the root of that mod n, and that is your encrypted message for textbook RSA. Um, so we believe that this problem is hard in general without the size constraint, constraint solution um, if we believe that RSA encryption is, is secure. It would also break factoring, right? Yeah. With the quadratic. 
Um, so, uh, but of course, for some kinds of n, we can solve this problem efficiently. So if n is prime, then you can find roots of polynomials mod primes uh, efficiently. Um, and if we know the factorization of n, then we can totally um, solve mod each prime and then like use Chinese remainder theorem, hence a lifting um, to basically get a solution mod n if we know the full factorization of n. So the thing that's interesting about Coppersmith's theorem is that um, we can find these solutions without actually factoring n. So uh, we gave up a little bit. We can only find small solutions, but we can find small solutions no matter what n is. Um, so if, uh, so, what, what, so, so if you apply, if you apply to the first equation, yeah. it doesn't give us anything right now. Yeah. Um, you can say, I have an example of this. Um, so certainly like if we, if we eliminate that, um, uh, so if, uh, if you, well, if, if you're looking for small, if there's a small solution here, like without the mod n part, um, then you can totally compute that because that's over the integers. So that's what, what Coppersmith's theorem is. When the small is like the e through the pen, right? So now if you, the x, then x to the e, this equation becomes over the integers. Yes. yes. So then it's boring. Um, so this is, uh, so Coppersmith's theorem is interesting only for like other kinds of polynomials yeah. that don't look exactly like that. Because yeah, if, um, if x is le or if, if your solution is is less than n to the one over e, then you just have a solution over the integers, and that's kind of why the theorem works uh, in the first place. So this is totally doable. Um, this is suppose you had a, so a number of com things come together, right? If you had small e like 17 or something, and then you're using textbook RSA with like no padding. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I see. But there's no wraparound, so it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in some sense, this example tells us that like this theorem is working sort of when we expect it to. So for for this, it's boring. But if we started adding like extra monomials in here, um, then it wouldn't be obvious that we'd be able to find this. Uh, so you can factor this way. You said by that there was a question before before that you you can factor the modulus with the quadratic. Quadratic, yeah. And so can you argue this way that uh, um, approximate the lattice problems for approximation factors for which the problem is not uh, MP hard are still at least as hard as factoring to provide some kind of uh, hardness for approximate SVP? Wasn't Aitai's program in the first place? That's what Aitai was trying to do. And then uh, he managed to prove MP hardness. Okay. <laughs> and at, at which point the question of whether you could reduce factoring to lapses uh, became theoretically less uh, interesting. He was using the exact version of SV of SV mm -hmm. at the time. So the question is whether the problem could be revisited for the approximate uh, lattice problems. Because um, method doesn't care about the approximation factor. Yeah. I mean, there are other versions that do. So maybe that's an interesting. Add, add an open question. Danielle is open question at the bottom. Um, so okay, I will I will try to go over the proof of of Coppersmith's theorem. Um, so we'll see how this works. So we're going to input our polynomial f. So it's some degree d whatever um, uh, integer coefficients and our integer modulus n. And we want to find all small roots r uh, mod n, uh, and we have this bound capital R on the size of the root that we're looking for. Um, so the way that this algorithm works, it, it, it's, uh, it works by constructing this auxiliary polynomial, um, and I'm going to call this q of x, um, so that uh, any root um, that is a solution here is a root over the integers, and then we can just um, find, we can just factor this polynomial and find its uh, integer roots. Um, check them if they satisfy this, and then output the ones that do. So that is our general program um, that we're going to try to do. Okay, so um, this has kind of two steps. 
One is um, like how do we how do we ensure this? So first, we can ensure that any polynomial that is constructed by the algorithm, is, um, if we evaluate it at our, our root solution here, it's zero mod n, um, and we do that by construction, um, and we do that by constructing it from essentially our inputs. So um, we know that f of r is zero mod n, mod n because it is a root mod n. That's just our solution. We also know that n is zero mod n. So any like any for example, integer linear combination of these two is also zero mod n, um, but also any polynomial combination of these two is zero mod n. So we're going to take polynomial, like integer polynomial combinations of these two inputs, and we're going to try to construct our auxiliary polynomial from these two things. Um, so that ensures, as long as we know that we have this structure, then Q evaluated at root is going to be zero mod n. So we're good by construction. So that's property number one. Property number two is making sure that um, our auxiliary polynomial, when we evaluate it at our solution, um, desired solution, it's strictly less than n. So um, that we're going to try to do by like sort of stupid um, bounds, like if we just sort of bound the evaluation of our polynomial um, with absolute values, um, then if you sum all of these up and if this is less than n, then we're good. So once you have these two properties, then something that is zero mod n and strictly less than n, the only proper possible value that that is is zero. So now we know that Q of R is actually identically zero, and so then it's um, R is a root over the integers, and we can just find it efficiently because factoring polynomials over the integers is, is efficient. Okay, we're good with our program so far. Okay, so concrete example of this. Um, if we limited ourselves to auxiliary polynomials of degree three, um, to be super concrete, it looks something like this. Um, the only multiple of x or of f that has degree three is the integer multiple of that. Um, then we can take some powers of n, like powers of x times n. That's cool. And then some integer coefficients. And if we write them out like this, then we get the coefficients of our, our auxiliary polynomial. And I'm being super literal about this because what we're actually going to do is like just look at the coefficient embedding of this as a lattice basis. And so we can write down this simple looking lattice basis. And then we know that the coefficient vector of our desired polynomial is a vector in this lattice. We're not quite there yet because I said we wanted to bound like this value. Um, so the easy way to do this is to just kind of like add these extra scaling coefficients like into our lattice. And then that means the L1 norm of any coefficient or any, any vector in this lattice um, happens to like kind of match exactly this va value that we want to bound. And so if this is strictly less than n, then we're done. So now we're looking for a relatively short vector in this concrete lattice that we constructed. And how do we do that? We run LLL on it. Right? So this is kind of the summary of what we did so far. Okay, so we're gonna construct the lattice of the scaled coefficient embedding, embedding of some suitably chosen polynomials. We're gonna find a short vector in the, in the lattice. So if we use LLL, then we know that we want, okay, so we have the L1 norm of the vector. We can bound that using the L2 norm. Then we can bound the L2 norm, I'm gonna drop the square root of n here, by um, the bound that we get from LLL. And if this is strictly less than n, then we know that this is strictly less than n, and then we're done. The only thing that we need to ver verify now is like this quantity here. So, okay. Um, so, let's see. I think I have the calculations later on. But basically, what you do is you just construct lattices, check the determinant bound, and when if the determinant bound says that this applies, then you're good. So, um, actually achieving the Coppersmith bound of like n to the one over d is a little bit annoying. There's an there's a optimization problem that I don't want to show you. Um, the way that you get that is there's two extra things. One of them is instead of taking just like, um, say, single powers of these values, if you take higher, higher multiplicities, like powers of f and powers of n, um, then you need um, then you need that to achieve the theorem. The other thing you can do is increase the total degree of the auxiliary polynomial that you're willing to do. And the degree of the auxiliary polynomial is exactly the dimension of the lattice that you're reducing. It also tells you a bound on the number of possible solutions that you can get. So um, these two things, um, plus being clever about which of the polynomials 
um, because you can generate like a large number of polynomials that satisfy this, that you want to take a linear combination of them and you're clever about which ones you actually in, like include in your lattice basis that you're going to reduce. So that is the kind of full um, set of sort of tricks that, that Coppersmith's theorem exploits. This is super black magic, right? Uh, like, 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 why does this technique itself, without this optimization business, give you, well, it does give you something, but not the Coppersmith. Yeah, it gives you, um, it gives you a, a lesser bound. So I think this, uh, this gives you n to the one sixth, like with a with a four by four lattice. Like n to the one over two. Yeah, um, and I mean you can you can just like write stuff down and, and like if you care about things that are much less than n to the one over d, you can usually solve it which, with much smaller lattices. Okay. And everything here is provable, right? There's nothing heuristic here. Yeah. There's nothing heuristic here. Um, so yeah, um, that's a good point. So there's nothing heuristic here, and um, the exponential approximation factor of LLL turns into a constant factor loss in the size of the root that you can find. So the two to the two to the n turns into a like n over half to the one over d, and you can get rid of that just by like root force. So that's pretty cool. Like this is this is one of those like rare examples of like lattice crypt analysis that is like totally rigorous and like doesn't care about the approximation factor of LLL, which is like magical. Um, What's the, how, how does the uh, two to the n influence the ultimate bound size? Um, it's a, there's a half. Um, I think it's n to the one over d divided by two. Okay. So. Okay. You, yeah. And is it because the dimension is gonna be at least n anyway, or how does that? Because uh, uh, when you look at the term, you have the two to the n over four, and then you have the determinant to the one over d, so. So when you're, um, when you're actually constructing this thing, you end up, um, the dimension of the lattice is gonna be a polynomial in, in like d. Putting like the two to the n like into the other um, factors and like kind of pulling them out. <coughs> so the size of your bound is 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 in here. Is it? I don't know. I feel like maybe there's a cleaner way to explain it, but like all I know how to do is like write down the optimization problem, which is crazy. But if you like write down the determinant of this thing, like in general, in terms of like the degree and multiplicity, and then you like solve for what the optimum value is. You can just like fold the approximation factor in to the value of, of the bound. Massively waving my hands here. Okay. Um, I want to mention briefly um, a result that I have with uh, Ted Chinberg and Zach Sher and, and Brett Hemingway, um, which uh, the question is whether this is optimal. Um, and this is optimal in the sense that. Um, if you have any method trying to solve this problem that constructs an auxiliary polynomial that preserves the algebraic roots of your input polynomial, um, then you can't improve this bound. Um, so uh, there may be improvements that like don't preserve all the algebraic roots, but um, that is. Yeah, so, so it may be, um, it's, it's certainly the case that there exist polynomials that, yeah, they have like exponential uh, roots. Like, so an example is, is like, um, you know, uh, solving some polynomial on like a, a big power of two. Um, so like once you get just beyond the, the bound, then you can have. So clearly you can't enumerate, but you're saying even the one would hope to find one solution because of its bound. Yeah, and there, there are polynomials where like, for example, like the RSA, problem where we know that there's a, a, a unique solution right. and like even if we had a promise of there being a unique solution that it um, then we still can't enumerate all of them or find any yeah so I've heard it said I forget by who that the, the Coppersmith method is can be seen as like a list uh, list of coding has a lot in common with list of coding paragraphing codes can yeah you, can you explain can you substantiate that um I have a whole paper with Henry Cohn about this um it is uh, from 2011. So you can write down, um, let's see, actually, so there is an exact correspondence between um, the Halgrave-Gram partial factoring, or factoring with partial knowledge, 
um, or like the single variable approximate GCD problem and the Reed Solomon list decoding problem. I'll talk about the um, factoring of par partial knowledge problem. But basically, if you restate the factoring of, with partial knowledge problem over the ring of polynomials rather than over the ring of integers, and you use polynomial lattice basis reduction, then you get a, exactly Reed Solomon list decoding. Cool stuff. I didn't put that in the talk, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you can you can do Coppersmith's method for other rings. Um, so in this in this paper, we um, we also wrote down in addition to writing down Coppersmith's method for polynomial rings, we wrote it down for like ideal um, like rings of number over number fields. Um, and it gets really disgusting, right? Because like um, the natural way to do it, I was going to talk about this in a little bit. The natural way to do this is to like have every integer here be like the canonical embedding, like a, a blockwise matrix, and then you get this horrible, gigantic lattice. You can do it, but then the, the dimension of the lattice blows up so much that it seems hardly worth doing. But maybe there's something here. I don't know. Because the, um, the amplification method that Coppersmith has by taking like extra powers of things um, does, I mean, it gives you a non-trivial result in the, in the integer. So, right, okay. Open problem, can you say anything else about this? Like, copper swim method, seem, we seem to have a pretty exact, like, impossibility result, but, like, this is weak in some sense, so it would be nice to say something about RSA, but, like, that would be proving that RSA is actually hard, so maybe you can't. Um, the other thing is that um, the notion of black magic has come up multiple times. So one of the black magic things is, like, how do you know which polynomials you include in your basis? And, like, I don't know how to do this. I just played with them and like figured it out. And this is what everybody who does this does. Um, so I don't have like a systematic description of like what you do, other than play with it and like see what works and see what doesn't. This is super annoying. Um, okay, we're gonna do some applications because I'm secretly like a practical person who like snuck in to this somehow. Um, so just make sure. I mean, we mentioned RSA before, but just make sure everybody's like on the same page about RSA. Like, we have our public modulus PQ. We shouldn't be able to factor this. That would be bad. We have an encryption exponent. Everybody uses small ones in practice, so we can just say E is small. It's fine. Um, then our decryption exponent is E inverse mod phi of n. Um, and then we encrypt by, like, raising our message to the E. Decrypt by raising our message to the E. That's what I say. Just make sure that everybody's on the same page. We're going to be doing a bunch of examples about breaking RSA. Um, so let's start with this one. We already saw this one, so this should be easy. Okay, so we have, this is Sage code. Um, so I have my uh, message, um, and I want to just encode it, like I, I just did a super lazy integer encoding, it, like to get numbers and integers. Um, so this is just, I made this into a, an integer. Um, and then I have 1024-bit um, RSA, so I have a 1024-bit modulus, um, and then I do textbook RSA message cubed mod n. Okay, is there a problem here? Why 35, then, um, Because uh, 26 <laughs> plus right. 9. I think I was missing one, but. Oh, OK, OK. Then just because it's easy to write. Uh, 1 through 9. Yeah. One through eight, maybe. yeah, so A through Z plus 1 through 9. It doesn't wrap around. Yeah. Yes. So um, yeah, there's a problem. The mod n is not doing anything, because like, this is this is not anywhere near um, like 1024 bits. So if I just like take the integer cube root of my ciphertext, then I totally get my plain text back. So that's bad. So I'll use padding, right? I like giving this to undergrads. Um, okay, here's another example. So I made a smaller modulus that's just so, so it will fit on the page. So that's not the insecure part. Um, so now I have my message. Um, which is the password for today's swordfish, and I encode it as an integer the same way, um, and I encrypt it using textbook RSA um, with uh, x13, and I just want to make sure that, okay, so it is not the case that we don't wrap around. So I made my modulus small enough so that, like, this wraps around. So we don't have that problem. Um, but, like, maybe if somebody happens to know that, like, um, the message has this, like, fixed formatting, like the password for today is, and then the message, then they could try to guess it. So, okay. Um, so our adversary starts by like writing down some value that's like 
the, the padding for the message that they can guess. So the password for today is, and then some guess for like the length of the password. Then um, they make some value. This is just a placeholder. This is like our upper bound on the, the size of the password that we're going to try to find. Um, then we construct exactly this, this lattice that I constructed before. Um, so it's a four by four lattice, and we have some like powers of n here, and then we have the coefficients of our polynomial, <coughs> like, you know, x to the e minus ciphertext. Sorry, why x is in the, this is supposed to be? Uh, capital x is just this, this bound on the size of the root that we're looking for. So I, this is? This was what was r. So is it five, or hmm? is this, why did you use a little x instead of like nine, you know nine, nine or something? Oh, this one? Oh, yeah, I should have just used 9999, but it works anyway. So, so swordfish comes before XXX in that dictionary. That's all that matters. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess 999 would be, if I should have used easy, 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 easy. But, but this works. Okay. Um, okay, so here's my, here's my lattice basis. Um, now I run LLL on it, and I take. Um, the first vector, and I take, a, I construct this polynomial from the coefficients of my first vector, and I'm like re rescaling as necessary. And then I compute the roots, and there is one root of my polynomial over the integers, and it is exactly the solution. So this totally works, right? Yeah. Do I have okay. Um, Another, I feel like in a room full of theorists, it's like important to show that like things actually like can be computed. Um, okay, so uh, here is the the um, question that Chris was raising of um, uh, kind of finding solutions modular divisors. So this is just like the Coppersmith version, but instead of so we have some polynomial and we have some integer n, but instead of finding solutions mod n, we want to find solutions modded divisor b of n. So like some. We want to find all the roots such that like f of r is 0 mod b for b divides n, and b is larger than like some value. Uh, I should have said beta is between 0 and 1. Um, that's also an input here. Um, so, um, and then we can find these roots when it's less than n to the beta squared over the degree. So this, without finding b? Uh, yeah, with a, um, this will give you. If, once you have R, then you can compute the GCD of right. like. That's right. Yes. Because B is not an input. Hmm? B is not an input. B is not an input. So um, this is the statement that like if we're given an n, we don't know the factorization of n. But if there exist any roots mod any divisor of n, um, then it will find it. And then then we can yeah compute the divisors if we want to. Um, so and the proof is basically the same as Coppersmith's univariate method. So what I just showed you, instead of finding a, a lattice vector that's like less than n, we're looking for a lattice vector that's like less than n to the beta, which would be less than b. <coughs> so the reed solomon list decoding problem, um, you state this theorem of mod polynomials, and then um, your n is going to be the product of like x minus like all of your evaluation points. The divisor is going to tell you which evaluation yeah. points you're. Yeah, it's going to tell you the, the errors of the uh, the correct locations. Oh, so, okay, so it's the, the module is divided by the error locating polynomial. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one super interesting uh, application of this theorem is factoring with par partial knowledge. So um, if you were given half of the bits say the most releasing fit half of the bits of one of the factors p of an RSA modulus p times q, um, then you can factor the modulus in polynomial time. So the proof is super simple. So like if, um, if we had this value, uh, I'm using like the, the mathematical ver like version of foo for like variables here. So a is like the most significant half of the bits of um, a factor p. Um, and uh, like it's also multiplied by some power of two. So like there is some value where like a plus r is equal to p, where r is small and a is some value that we know. Um, then we can construct our polynomial x plus a, and we know that f of r is zero mod p. Um, and say p is the larger of the two factors. 
So it's bounded by n to the 1 half. So we're applying the theorem before with degree d equals 1 and beta equals a half. And so this should be able to find roots that are less than n to the beta squared over d, which is n to the 1 fourth, which is exactly half of um, the length of the So this is polynomial time. And this is also not heuristic. That's the case, but you can, in certain examples like the one on the next slide, you can actually find the P So if, there, if for the bounds that you put into the problem, there exists a fact, so it'll find all roots right. such that um, if there exists a root um, mod some factor, then it'll output. By the way, this gives you a bound on the number of possible values that satisfy this. Other questions? So this, this will give you everything that satisfies uh, the problem. Um, okay, so just to like prove to you that this works, um, I'll do the concrete example. So we have P and Q are 512 bits, um, and we have RSA modulus P times Q, and then I have my value A. I'm gonna erase the 86 least significant bits of, of P. So if I write it out, I've erased the 86 least significant bits. Um, so I'm gonna do this key recovery of from partial information. I'm gonna do this with a three-dimensional lattice. So I define some bound, just like some power of two, two to the 86 is bigger than the 86 bits that I deleted. Um, I construct a three-dimensional lattice. Um, I run LLL, construct a polynomial, and then um, A plus the root is equal to P. There was only one root, but I had to like pick it out. Is it re the repeated root? This is a quadratic polynomial. Uh, yeah, it's a quadratic polynomial. Oh yeah, there is a, there is some other root. I don't know what it is. I guess you could run this and, and see. <laughs> um, so is there a reason why beta squared is actually a natural bound, or do you expect it to improve? Um, so if you think that um, Reed Solomon list decoding is optimal, um, then this beta squared gives you exactly the bound for Reed Solomon list decoding. So I think there's some proof that um, the list decoding bound is, is optimal. Um, but of course, for the case um, where, say, n does not have a lot of factors, um, then you then that wouldn't apply. And so then um, there would be cases where you would have you would have fewer factors. Um, with uh, Ted Schinberg and, and Zach Scher and Brett Hemingway, we looked at this and um, trying to prove like a similar kind of bound as for the Coppersmith case with auxiliary polynomials um, produces like it requires new theory that Ted doesn't know how to do. So we don't have the result, um, but th that is that is an open problem. Um, is like. Having some having some bound here. Um, I'm going to skip this calculation because it's boring. Um, this is just like how to do the the determinant bound. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, kind of other kinds of RSA attacks if you care about practice, like so say factoring, given half the bits of p, quarter of the bits of d, um, half the bits of d mod p minus one. These are all like in the same framework. So um, I'm going to move on to another example. Um, so this is small RSA D. So I've constructed my RSA modulus, same as before, and it was P times Q. Um, D, I made a little bit less than a quarter of the bits of N. So it's 254 bits, which should be like cryptographically, like that's a cryptographically large number. Um, and I constructed E as I was supposed to. Um, so e, D is small, but it's not that small. Um, and here I do some black magic again. I construct a three by three lattice. I run LLL on it. And it turns out that like D is actually just spat out in one of the coordinates. Um, so that's D 
small d attack. So um, this is the lattice-based version of a theorem of Wiener. Um, so basically, you can officially c you compute d when d is less than n to the, to n to the 1 fourth. Um, he did it using continued fractions, but you could also do it with a small lattice. Um, and the way this works, you can write this actually as kind of a, in the same framework as we've been talking about. So we have this RSA equation, which is e and d are inverses mod p of n, right? And we can make this into an integer equation by introducing an integer multiple k here. Um, so now we have like, so we have this like integer equation in some unknowns. We don't, we know e, we don't know d, we don't know k, we do know n, we know one, we don't know p and q, but we do know one. So there's some values we know and some, there's some there's values that we don't know. Um, so if we let s equals p times q, computing p time p plus or p plus q is like enough to factor n. Um, then we can rewrite this. I've put all the values that we don't know in red. Um, we do know some bounds on them. So we have like kind of this um, integer uh, like multivariate equation with some unknowns that are we have bounds on that we would like to solve for. Um, so we can rewrite this. Um, and so if we, we basically have two variables here. Um, and we would like to, we have an equation that look, looks like this, and we would, would like to find a solution mod n plus 1. Um, so this is a integer linear combination of two variables. And essentially what I'm doing is a variation of the same technique as before. So I have some bounds on the size of the, um, of the solution that I'm looking for. I construct a lattice basis that corresponds to the coefficients of some cleverly chosen um, polynomials that happen to satisfy the solution that I'm looking for. And the lattice reduction is actually finding this equation. So I'm just pulling out um, the solution from the coefficient here. And, um, if I want to, I can like compute like the, the dimension of the So this is, I mean, I'm putting this in like the bivariate coppersmith framework, but it doesn't actually require that. So this result is, is outright provable. It's not, it's not heuristic at all. Um, but I'm putting it in that, in that framework just because it's nice to put it in that framework. Um, you should be able to do this with a two by two lattice, but it's like a little bit more opaque. Um, so, but I do want to mention that um, there's this theorem of Bonnet and Durfee. They improve this bound a little bit by basically taking the same equation and like applying the Coppersmith techniques of like higher multiplicity and degree. Um, so they were able to improve the bound to n to the point 292, which is kind of a strange looking value. Um, and so essentially, they're clever about their choice of sublattice and they're using higher multiplicities and degree. Um, they conjecture that their method can be improved to the n to the point 5, but like nobody's been able to do that. Yeah. Algebraic uh, description of this 292? It's 302. It's, huh? it's 302. It's uh, log, uh, log 2 of 300. Okay. It's what? I, it's a constant we've seen somewhere else. Uh, yeah, they, they have it in their paper. I forget exactly what it is. Did you? Spherical 302 is like a lattice. It's the same as spherical 302 as well. That sounds possible. I thought it was like 0.5 minus something in their paper, but it, I don't remember. Or maybe, maybe, um, maybe it can be rewritten. Um, okay. Um, so in general, okay, so we, we just sort of like tried to extract, uh, sort of expand um, our techniques from like univariate polynomials to like multivariate polynomials, possibly systems of polynomials. Um, and so your input would be like some multivariate polynomial or some like um, maybe some system of polynomials. Um, and you want to output a bunch of integers such that like your polynomial vanishes mod n. Um, and you can kind of do the same thing, but it's like suddenly much less rigorous and you can't prove anything and it's like totally a black art um, and everybody just does ad hoc things. So what you want to do is essentially like find a collection of, like you construct the same kind of lattice and do the same kinds of bounds checking. Um, and you want to find a bunch of short vectors in your lattice that correspond to a system of um, multivariate polynomials and dump them into like a, 
um, a solver and have it spit out the, the solutions of the common roots. Um, there's a bunch of issues. Uh, one, okay, so you have to find a bunch of short equations, you have to, or short vectors, um, you run into issues of algebraic independence. Um, so much like sort of the ring LWE um, things that we've been talking about, the additive lattice loses information about the multiplicative structure of the ideal that we have. So like we can have two vectors that are linearly independent um, as vectors, but they, their coefficients are algebraically dependent Theorems are totally heuristic, so no totally generic solution is possible. Um, you can write down um, uh, polynomials, multivariate polynomials that just have infinite numbers of solutions, so you just can't do it. Um, but in many of the crypto, crypto analytic cases that we care about, there should be like a you know unique set of solutions, and so you would hope to be able to find them. You can it sometimes. Sometimes. So the results are essentially totally ad hoc. So um, people have tried to give useful characterizations for when multivariate coppersmith works, and um, none of them seem that satisfying. Um, they're all very ugly. I'm sorry if it's your work. Um, so I want to mention a, a brief uh, sort of application of this um, to the approximate common divisor problem. So we already saw a ring LWE. Um, so you can think of the approximate common divisor problem as one-dimensional ring LWE over the ring of integers. Um, so this is convenient. So your input is this uh, collection of integers, which are multiples of some secret integer P. So that's going to be like the generator of our, um, of our ideal secret. Um, and then plus some small errors R. Um, so you get uh, a bunch of these. And the problem is to find P or equivalently to find um, some of the RIs at any point. And there's one difference which seems at least syntactically important. You don't get the QIs. As opposed to yes, yeah. but if you got the QIs, then you're yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. I never kind of fully yeah. understood the connection there. But I mean, it's clear the algorithms for, for approximate GCD are much more powerful than, yeah. than ring LB. Okay. Um, so you have to, yeah, you have to, you have to hide a lot more information to, to yeah. make this problem hard. Um, but I guess it's equivalent. Um, so you can try to put this into the same kind of framework if you want. So you can like um, write down a series of like linear equations that um, have solutions that are small um, that would all vanish like mod some um, uh, mod the same value. You construct a lattice of polynomial combinations. You find a bunch of short multivariate polynomials in this lattice, and you find the common roots. Um, so that's like the general framework. Uh, this works for some parameters, but it fails for small p. Um, and the reason it fails is due to the approximation factor of lattice reduction. So this magic thing where the Coppersmith and Halgrave Graham uh, results were totally rigorous and, and didn't have any problems with the exponential approximation factor of LLL in one variable, suddenly it does have a, a, a problem with the uh, approximation factor of LLL in multiple um, variables. So you're saying for this to be not yet breakable, you have to pick Q to be so much larger than P. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is your paper. <laughs> sure, 10 years ago, lots of things happened in 10 years. <laughs> um, I mean, my paper about this was like, yeah, also that long ago, so I barely remember it. Um, so you can try to do the same thing with ring LWE if you want. Um, this results in like gigantic dimensional lattices, right? Like, because you have like these like huge numbers of like canonical embeddings that you're putting in, like powers of your canonical embeddings. So it seems like kind of nonsensical. Maybe there's something better that you can do that like doesn't require you to put blocks of canonical embeddings. Um, but it, it's like kind of tempting to want to say like maybe some of the, the clever ideas from like Coppersmith land um, could be useful here. Um, so, yeah. I mean, so the point is that, I mean, the dimension, even if you do it, the dimension will be polynomial in N and then LLL is polynomial in N. So, like, in principle, this, this you kind of get a quadratic hit in the approximation factor because, like, your dimension is like. Well, through the n squared now. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then it starts to matter. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it, and it's like super ugly. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't seem to like give you much improvement. Okay. Uh, so unless you can like find some better way to deal with the canonical ideal or something. Or the, yeah, the, the so in principle, you can run the algorithm just giving you a useless answer. Uh, I have like five minutes left. Um, 
Okay, so the last, uh, the last thing I want to mention um, for, for technique-wise um, is the hidden number problem. So uh, the hidden number problem, we have some secret integer alpha, um, and we have a public parameter, this is our modulus n, some integer, um, and we get multiples. Um, so you, like, it's an oracle problem. You, you hit a button, um, the oracle chooses a random uh, integer ti, and then computes ti alpha mod n, and then hands you the most significant bits of ti alpha reduced mod n. Um, and those significant bits I'll call ai, because that's my favorite variable name. Uh, so you get a bunch of pairs ti um, ai, and then the desired output is alpha. So you can formulate this in like kind of the same framework as we were thinking before um, as a system of equations and some unknowns. So we have unknowns r1 through rm and alpha, and so we have a system of linear equations again, so there's unknowns r and unknowns alpha. This looks a lot like the stuff that we've seen before, right? Like, um, so we have a general sized alpha and small ris, um, and so the hope is to like be able to solve the system. And you can do this, so there's a couple of techniques. Um, maybe I'll jump over this. It should be clear that you can basically like do the same thing as you were doing before um, by putting in um, coefficients here. Um, or you can take the dual. The usual approach is actually like the dual of this lattice. Um, so here, um, the original paper did it as a CVP problem. So you have your target is like your values. And then um, like if you take um, the distance between this and some lattice vector um, mod n will be alpha times this vector mod n, um, and that will be, wait, did I do this wrong? No, that's right. Right. Okay, this, is a, this, is, this will be r, and this should be close to a. Okay. Um, you can embed this. Um, if, if you don't like solving CBP, which nobody in practice likes solving CBP, um, you can just increase the dimension of your lattice by a couple of, um, by like two and um, do it so that if you find a short vector, it will be your solution. Um, so again, we have this with some sort of scaling vectors. Factors um, is a short vector in this lattice. Um, and I don't feel like doing the calculations. Um, so basically you can like do, you can like write down the determinant and like compute like the like, length of the vector that you expect to find. Um, and so you expect to find this vector um, when your bound is, is sort of in this, it only works uh, for random lattices, and this is this is a heuristic result. So the original Boni and Vicatison result essentially said that um, the limiting behavior, um, because these are random values and because you're using lattices, um, this works for like square, up to square root of log n samples, and you have to reveal square root of log n um, most significant bits of your samples. Um, the dumb question that I have that I have not been able to figure out is. If you stare at this formulation, you're like, this looks just like all the other Coppersmith type things that we saw. Like, why can't you just like do more multiplicities and get a better result? Um, and it doesn't seem to work. And I can't figure out why. And it feels really dumb that I can't figure out why it doesn't work. So maybe somebody can figure that out. Um, so all the sort of Coppersmith type tricks that I know about doesn't seem to actually improve the result. Um, and I can't figure out why. Um, this, this is like provable algorithmic. This is your Oh, that's your For random instances with some probability. Okay. But if it, but it's uh, experimentally, this checks out or? Experimentally it works. Um, you need, let's see. Uh, it is, so here you actually need to solve CVP. And so you need the, the length of the vector that you're finding to be like in like shorter than, than all the other ones. That's the heuristic part. But even um, even if you're solving CVP, you need there not to be any shorter um, lattice vectors. So in this case, uh, you can you can end up with problems if you have lattice vectors that are smaller than your solution. So 
but if you for random instances, you hope that your, your lattice vectors are not smaller than your solution. If, if your input is random, you can certainly lower upon the, the covering radius. And then so I don't think anybody has done any super sophisticated analysis with this since like 1996. So if you want to like help analyze it more carefully, then there might be something to do here. Um, so the application that everybody does in practice is breaking uh, ECDSA. Um, so ECDSA, the, the important thing is that you have, um, that your signature depends on the secret nonce, um, the hash of your message, your secret key, and then a public part of your signature. Um, and this is a linear equation. And so you have some unknowns which are here in your secret key. And so if you write out, if you get a bunch of DSA or ECDSA signatures, you get a sequence of linear equations that maps exactly into um, the hidden number problem. And so if somebody screws up in generating their, um, their signature nonces, <coughs> or they reveal some of the most significant bits of their signature nonces, then we are exactly in this framework of applying the hidden number problem. Um, and so people use this all the time in practice for side channel analysis. Um, basically, OK, so this is my like, second to last slide. So there's also a Fourier analysis algorithm for the hidden number problem, but it requires many more samples than the lattice one, um, and it's kind of a pain. So it seems like there should be some kind of like smooth trade-off or some relationship between these algorithms, and I don't know of any. Um, uh, but also, and also the second application is, or the second open problem that I have is a little bit more applied. So the original Bonin van Kettesen application was to prove that the um, most significant bits of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange are, are hardcore. Um, as far as I know, nobody's ever actually found a realistic scenario where this applies in the wild. So it would be super cool. What does that mean? Hmm? What does that mean? Um, so right now everybody uses this to exploit DSA and ECDSA in the wild. But nobody has ever found a vulnerability that like gives you the most significant bits of a Diffie-Hellman secret. And if somebody did find such a vulnerability, then you'd be able to apply the hidden number problem and it'd be super cool. But I've never seen that. Yeah? Just remind us what you mean by hardcore. Mm. It means that if you can learn those bits, th um, then you can learn the entire value. So learning, so those bits are as hard as learning the entire secret. Um, so the uh, the principle here is that the hidden number problem, um, if you get like <coughs> some of the most significant bits of something that is derived from your secret, then you can compute the secret. That's how the reduction works. OK. So generally, summary, um, there is a bunch of different lattice constructions for cryptanalysis. I tried to put them all in a somewhat consistent framework. Um, but there's kind of this general open problem, which is like the theme that I had, which is a lot of these applications feel like a black art, right? So like you think really hard, and you like try applying things, and people write papers over decades like making small improvements to these things. Like, why can't we just systematically like characterize everything instead of having to do manual calculation for every single application. Um, it feels kind of painful if there's like no general theory. Like when does the approximation factor matter and when doesn't it? Um, when is the coefficient embedding better than like eva the evaluation embedding? Um, sometimes it makes a difference in practice and sometimes it doesn't. When do amplification techniques like multiplicity and degree work and when do they not? Um, which polynomials in your ideal do you include in your lattice basis? Um, all of these things are sort of like annoyingly um, black art. So this is my last slide. So thank you.